Great question, great comment. I think you all heard it. Uh, I think you're right on point, and that's why the leadership in both the House and the Senate have had a stimulus package of their own that was primarily dealing with incentives to the tax code to let people keep more of their money to recover the economy just as Ronald Reagan did. So every major piece of legislation, including health care, Republicans come up with a, a positive alternative. But since you asked, let me share a couple thoughts uh, that are just may only be my own thoughts. But I think fundamental to it is we must make sure that we eliminate the practice of having earmarked legislation. That is a corruption that will destroy our country. Now, I know a lot of good people say, well, you know, that's not realistic. You have to let those people earmark things. Uh, you don't have to let them earmark things. The simple fact is that it's the job of the executive to carry out the laws and Congress to pass it. But what happens with the earmarks is a corruption. Because what happens with the earmarks is people then end up voting for a bill that they would normally oppose because they've gotten some handout money within their own district. It is not the biggest amount of money in the world. It is significant. The problem is the corruption that it engenders because it gets people to vote for legislation they would never dream of supporting. I think if, if you, one of the things that when I went on the Ways and Means Committee in the House, Chairman Rostenkowski came to me, uh, kind of complimented and welcomed me to the committee. Uh, he said, we look forward to working with you and uh, you'll have a couple of amendments that you'll be entitled to. I said, well, thank you. I, I've got some ideas for simplification. I would work with you. And he said, and of course, we expect you to vote for the bill. <clears throat> and I said, well, I certainly hope I can vote for the bill. He said, no, you don't understand. You get two amendments and you pledge to vote for the bill. If you don't pledge to vote for the bill, you don't get to amendment. It's the same corruption that goes on in the tax code. Obviously, I wasn't able to do that. But we had a lot of fun. Uh, we did get some amendments passed over his objection, which doesn't happen very often. But the reality is that earmarking, both in the tax code and appropriations, is an abomination. It is the core of the corruption that takes place. Think about what we do. We have a program to subsidize tobacco, and then we have another program to urge people not to use tobacco. We have to be a little schizophrenic to, to think that makes sense. Makes sense. Uh, there are a hundred examples like that. So the first reform, I think, is to end your marks. The second is to pass a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. And it can be as simple as saying you have to have a two-thirds vote to deficit spending. But you have to have a constitutional limitation in that area. If you leave it to Congress, they will never be able to do it. Think about Colorado. <clears throat> We've never had a year where we haven't had a balanced budget. We've done it every single year. And the reason we have is because it's the right policy. And two, the legislators didn't have any choice. You have to have a constitutional amendment to require a balanced budget. Thirdly, I think you need term limits for members of Congress. serving Washington as a service to the country, and then came home. And the biggest uh, defeat of incumbents we ever had was in the early 1800s, when they voted themselves a pay raise from a dollar a day to, I think, three dollars a day. And uh, they turned out the majority of the House and uh, most of the senators were up for re-election uh, when that happened. It used to be that serving in Congress was a service to your country. Not a way of earning your living or dominating the world as you came about. And somehow it's been corrupted. That term limit is essential because what it will help us do is get people who've worked for them in Congress. The reality is so few of our members of the Senate or the House have worked for a living before they've gone to Congress. And it makes a difference because they don't understand the impact of the laws that they have come in. I'd also like to see a dramatic change uh, in the kind of programs that we allow to be law. 
we've got to go back through and eliminate what I call the welfare programs, the welfare mentality that's come about in our wide range of programs. Let me give an example. I don't know how many of you remember. A few years ago, uh, a train derailed up in Boulder County. It took out a section of a bridge uh, and shut down the highway. They were panicked because it was in nature, it was a significant thoroughfare. And the Colorado Department uh, of Highways uh, got a waiver from the federal government to rebuild that, uh, waiving all the requirements, the paperwork requirements to do that. <clears throat> they literally fixed that exchange over the weekend. And they did it at half the cost if it had been sprung out over six months. We have fallen into a mania that makes us think we have to regulate the life out of everything. And I think one of the fundamental changes we have to have is understand that due process applies both to statutes and to our regulations that come down. We never were meant to have unelected bureaucrats rule our lives. Having people who are elected rule our lives is a challenge enough, but having unelected people rule our lives through regulation is in what you need is not a radical change. We need good common sense uh, where the people who are elected take responsibility for the decisions that come out. You don't need anything radical in terms of this country. What you need is people who are honest and straightforward uh, to deal with it. But I think putting us on a sound basis financially and eliminating the pork barrel kind of spending that happens will do a lot to restore common sense to, to Washington, D.C.